Hello and welcome to another edition of the C-Squared Podcast. This is your host, Curtis, my co-host, Holly, and we are here today with Matt Coe, who is a journalist who has written for Dead Rhetoric, among other places, uh, over the last few years. And uh, we are going to be talking to him about journalism in general, writing, all that type of fun stuff. And uh, I think it's going to be an interesting conversation. So to start off, welcome, Matt, and we're glad to have you here. Thank you very much for having me on here. You're very welcome. So to start off, um, we're going to have Holly jump in with the very first question. Great. Well, I think it'd be really interesting to start with um, your history and how you got into music journalism. Well, um, I was into heavy metal when I was 12 years old. Um, Iron Maiden was kind of the first gateway band. And then from there, um, just started discovering more bands through reading magazines, trying to listen to specialty radio shows. Um, when I was 16, I wrote a letter to a heavy metal magazine, national magazine called Metal Mania Magazine. Um, they were doing an article on tape trading and I was interested in you know, expanding my music collection. So I got into tape trading from there because they published my letter and I had about 150 to 200 responses from all over the world. And then from there, uh, my senior year of high school, I started uh, writing for fanzines because of the tape trading network. And I started writing for Curious Goods, Comedy of Eras, Ill Literature, Gasp, etc. cetera. And uh, decided I wanted to start my own fanzine. So I started Spectrum. And then I became a part of the uh, Snake Pit magazine staff, uh, which was an overseas magazine from Germany in the late 90s, uh, became a co-editor for a few years, and then uh, started writing for websites when in, in print magazines started to shift. Um, wrote for a couple of Norwegian online fanzine, uh, online magazines called In Hoteb and Eternal Terror. Then I got asked by David uh, Gelke uh, to write for blistering.com, which transformed into Dead Rhetoric about eight years ago, and here I am. Wow. I have a quick question to follow up. Sorry, Holly, to cut you off, yeah. but what what do you feel is like the main difference between writing for print and writing for web? Out of curiosity, if there is one, um, I would say obviously the speed at which um, information is trans uh, transmitted online compared to in print. You have more time to kind of gather your thoughts. I think when you are writing for in print, usually the deadlines are a little bit longer. Um, so I think it's just the creativity and the speed uh, with which you have to process releases and information and getting news and interviews online in a timely manner, um, I think is the major difference. I would say my productivity is much higher uh, with dead rhetoric than it would be for an in-print uh, publication. You might have 30 or 40 items to review over a couple of months where yeah. online you need to do stuff often six times a week, seven times a week to uh, keep your audience interested. Yeah. Um, okay, so one other follow-up just to that part right there is, okay, so now you, now when you do write for print magazines, uh, is it generally that you get, um, how do I want to phrase this here? Do you generally get more freebies working for a print magazine than you do for a web <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it depends on, on the type of contacts that you have and the reach of the in-print publication. I would say in general, yes, I've gotten a lot more actual physical promos from uh, in-print uh, publications, but as we know, everything has kind of moved online. So I would say uh, 15 years ago, I was getting about 50 physical promos. Now I'm probably getting one or two maybe uh, compared to the 50 because um, everything has moved online, even, even for the print publications. Uh, I would say that there aren't as many freebies out there uh, in general. Fair. Okay, Holly, back over to you. I'm sorry to take it over. No, it's fine. That kind of links on kind of nicely to my, uh, my next question. Um, how have you found the sort of, with the shift online, have you noticed with more sort of news items being published that maybe reviews are being published slightly less? Um, and that maybe, I don't know, quality isn't quite the right word, but maybe the quality of writing has changed because of it? 
I do think things have changed in a sense online where um, because the average consumer can make their own decisions, I think they don't necessarily rely on journalists as much as they may have in the past with uh, in-print publications. Um, but then there are times where you're able to kind of generate your own interest based on people paying attention to the styles that you review and the types of bands that you interview. You can carve out a little niche of your own, but I think it takes a little bit longer because there are many times when I'm posting reviews or interviews, um, people are very quick to disagree with what I have to say or they just say in general, well, I don't take what reviewers say seriously because I can make up my own mind and my own judgment on, on these releases. So I think uh, the news does tend to have a little bit more importance sometimes than the reviews, but I think the bands themselves <clears throat> appreciate the reviews, especially if someone has years and years of experience with the style. Um, I think what I can offer listeners is a little bit more of my experience listening to thousands of releases over the years um, and being able to give them constructive criticism on their product. Mm. Yeah, I found that because a lot of bands, they, um, well, I think they appreciate the news items because it gets, uh, like, what week is more of an audience, but then they miss, like you say, having the feedback or um, some advice on maybe where they could improve that comes through reviews. Definitely, definitely. Mm. So Curtis, I, any follow-ups? <laughs> well, they have a follow-up, but it's, well, it's kind of a follow-up, but kind of not at the same time. Um, so how, I don't, I'm trying to remember here. The lot I don't even recall the time I've seen you really do a bad, like a really negative review. And I'm trying to think. I think if I have, have you done negative reviews, Matt? I have before. I mean, we try to just because of the sheer volume of releases. And right now, on our website, we have basically Katrina and I are the main writers. Um, yeah. David has been so busy writing books for uh, Decibel Books. Um, he had. Just uh, writing the obituary biography so yeah. he gets so busy that basically Katrina and I have kind of taken over a lot of the day-to-day -day operations and um, our philosophy has been well if we're going to publish as many reviews as we do um, we try to focus on ones that we think are average to good although uh, we have written bad reviews in the past I mean you, usually our bad reviews are three out of ten four out of ten th those types of ranges but I think we've tended to spend more time working on the average to good reviews right now just because of the sheer number of reviews that we want to get out there plus the the, the small staff that we have. Fair. Um, yeah, because I was going to ask you a question about bad reviews and I went, I don't recall Matt ever doing a bad review and so I just skipped. <laughs> let, I mean, let even, me if I, even if I do a bad review, I do try to be constructive about it. I'm not one of those people that's like, this sucks. And yeah basically try to put the band down. I want to give them constructive criticism in areas where I think that it's warranted and that they need the feedback because what's, what good is it to put, put a band down? There is none. Now, what I wanted to ask you about though, is like one thing that I've noticed, and I'm sure you probably have too, is that there seems to be a tendency for bands to get better reviews than they probably should. Yes. Why do you why do you think that would be? Because like I don't like as a PR, I like it when a band gets a good review, but at the same time, I know a nine out of ten for a band isn't. You know what I'm saying? It's yes. I, but how many band albums are really nine out of ten? You know what I mean? Right, right, yeah. yeah. I mean, it is very tough, and I think the problem is is you have a lot of writers that are afraid of. Um, speaking their truth because they feel like they may be dropped from a particular record label or a PR firm if they are brutally honest with their thought process behind it. So I think a lot of times the ratings are a little higher than probably they should be um, for that very reason. Because there have been many times that I've read reviews of 8 out of 10, 9 out of 10, and the sense that I get from the reviewer is there's enough issues with it that it probably should be like a seven out of 10, maybe 7.5 out of 10 rather than a nine out of 10. Yeah, or even like a five. Like, I mean, to me, a five is average. Most people go like that fucking sucks. But to me, right. most, I would think most things shouldn't be scoring higher than a five, six, maybe seven, unless it's like, you know, a classic album, but sure. that's just 
my own opinion. Obviously, as a PR, I'm not going to push for people to do that. But um, so what would you think? Do you think that do you, do you prefer doing numerical reviews then or do you prefer not to? If I had a choice, probably I would eliminate the number because yeah. I think a lot of times uh, re- people that read it gloss over it. it otherwise, yeah. um, I would prefer non-number you know, related reviews because I think the content is what matters the most. And I think another thing that a lot of reviewers fail to do that I'm fortunate enough that I have the opportunity to do because uh, I, I work by myself at an overnight job is I can have music the whole time I'm at work. So I don't tend to work on my reviews until I've listened to a product at least like seven to 10 times. Um, So that's where I think my reviews may differ from other people just because I am spending a lot of time with the release, even if it's a short 10, 15 minute EP, I want to give the bands and the labels and, and the PR firms a fair chance for me to assess the product, not just based on one listen because you can't listen to a progressive technical release one time and absorb all the information that's on there. Fair. Um, Holly, do you listen to them that many times when you do? I've just, I've never, I think that's a lot. That's, that's fucking amazing. Yeah. I, I don't manage that many. I try and listen at least twice, maybe three times if I can. Um, But it, it depends. Yeah. How busy I am as to whether I can do that or not. Well, that also explains why Matt's reviews are pretty, thorough 99.9 percent of the time as well um okay so you take like about 10 hours to do one review then on average yes wow okay so how the how heck do you manage to do so many a month like you seem to do a fair amount maybe I'm um, thinking. yeah i mean it comes down to discipline just pure and simple i mean i love the genre mm-hmm. i'm expressing myself i love writing and mm-hmm. Uh, it's like a muscle you have to prime it and you have to do it every day and so I usually spend you know three or four hours a day working on material whether it's reviews whether it's interviews coming up with questions um, writing uh, editing so yeah I mean I'm basically trying to write as much as I possibly can uh, but I also space it out in the sense that I, I will usually review for, you know, three to four hours at a time and then give myself a break. I can't uh, review usually more than two or three items uh, in a given session before I start feeling fatigue. Yeah. Okay. Holly, back over to you. I'm done on that one. Okay. Well, I guess it'd be quite interesting to delve into like the interviews that you do. Um, so I'd be quite interested to know, is there anything that you like to see from bands when you're interviewing them or anything that you really don't like to see? Yes. Um, I guess I'll start with what I don't like to see. Um, Curtis and I have had this discussion online. Uh, When a band has an opportunity to present themselves, I think they should present themselves as fully as they possibly can. Uh, Even if it's in an email question and answer format, uh, take the time to really... uh, delve into the questions and give intelligent, proper answers. Um, It does the band and the fans no no service to basically answer a intelligent question in like one line. Um, And there have been many times where I've worked a couple of hours on a set of 12 to 15 questions only to get back one line answers for everything as if it was rushed. And I feel like that's an opportunity lost. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, What I enjoy about the interviews a lot of times is just trying to delve more into the thought process behind the musicians and just learning about their songwriting craft, learning about um, how they grew up, their experiences, um, favorite moments in their career, uh, you know, sometimes debating specific lineup changes, the dis- discography and the choices that they've made through the years. Um, I really try my best to give the musician the opportunity uh, that they can and the understanding that they're in the hands of a journalist who really appreciates their art and their craft and isn't going to present an article that's just going to, you know, go for clickbait views. I mean, we're 
Rhetoric is more of an intelligent website. We take what we think the readers are, you know, avid fans of this genre and its offshoots, and we try to present the material in an intelligent, thoughtful manner. So I want to I want to ask a, a brief follow up on that, Holly, if that's OK. Yeah, go ahead. Cool. So um, what would you say then, because you said because you were talking about genre specifically, what would you actually be the genre that dead rhetoric mainly focuses on out of curiosity? I mean, we focus on heavy metal, definitely. Um, yeah. And all the sub genres of heavy metal. Um, I would say like my tastes are more traditional metal, thrash, power, speed, melodic death, uh, doom, gothic, and uh, Katrina tends to focus on a lot more of the symphonic or uh, technical death metal, some black metal. Um, sometimes we have genres that overlap um, and we'll even go as far as sometimes covering more of the commercial aspects, especially if a musician has had ties in the past or currently in uh, metal outfits. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, we tend to focus on most of the heavy music genres uh, as far as our website goes. Cool. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to ask you about just in regards to the website before I forget is um, what is the best way for people to pitch you like who don't have a PR, obviously? Um, I mean, on the website, basically on the uh, on the about section, it basically has all the emails of all the contributors. Um, we tend to get a lot of stuff directly through the main uh, email address. But I mean, as far as myself, like uh, copublicity at gmail.com is the best way to pitch me. Um, sometimes people pitch me online um, on social media as well. But uh, I find going through the email box is probably the easiest way to get in touch with me and to uh, keep up a correspondence because that way it just doesn't get lost in the mix. Fair. Um, Holly, did you have a follow-up on that before I do my follow-up to my follow-up? Um, I guess it'd be quite useful to know, are you looking for any specific information when bands contact you? Yeah, I mean, there are times where bands just will send me, say, a streaming link to their stuff, but sometimes they don't even provide a very basic bio um, and background information. And another pet peeve that ends up happening is uh, I'll end up reviewing the product and uh, I will mention what I think, uh, you know, the people that are in that particular lineup. And then all of a sudden I'll get an email once the review is published saying, you need to change this. Can you make sure you take this member out and put this member in? And it's just frustrating because I'm the one that's doing the research to try and find out about the lineup even if I've asked them questions directly. And then when I publish something, they immediately want me to make a correction, which I'm happy to make. I mean, I want I want the information to be accurate, but I guess that that's an area where if you know that the band members have changed and I've had to look it up either through your social media platforms or metal archives or some other encyclopedia, maybe you should uh, take the time to also make those changes correctly. Yeah, we have that problem too, where it's like, we'll, we'll have something written up for, for the client and they'll even approve it. And then later I'll be like, well, yep. why didn't you include this? Like, yep. <laughs> I had no idea. Like, can you get the site to correct? It's like, okay, but you told us something different than what you're saying. We've even had it where they've given us the wrong song title and we've put blasted it out. And then later after, mm -hmm. even after they've approved it and they're like, well, why'd you do that? Well, that's what you told us the name was. And even says it right there. So, right. I don't know. Anyways, bands are kind of weird. Um, so what, so how do you kind of respond in that case? Do you kind of, does, does, is that like an immediate blacklist for you or is it just kind of an annoyance? Yeah, it's more of an annoyance. I mean, most of the bands have been very friendly going about it. I mean, I've had one instance where a signed band on a pretty prominent label reached out to me and I had to basically go back to him and make a screenshot of the bio I was sent that said uh, he had actually played on the album when he hadn't. Uh -oh. So that was one of those that was very, very, he was very upset about the fact that basically the band uh, was misleading people into thinking that he had played on the album when he hadn't. So he wasn't necessarily mad at me. He, he, he basically expressed his anger then towards the label, but he wanted it corrected immediately. And so, uh, you know, I did what he asked me to do. 
that's unfortunate. I've seen that happen too. Um, Holly, do you got a follow up on that before we move on? Um, no, I don't think so, actually. Okay, um, I'm going to leave off on another tangent unless you wanted to keep yeah. going with your questions. Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay, so tangent going here. So let's, okay, so let's say Ben gets in touch with you, uh, wants to get a review. Um, you say no, or not, sorry, no, sorry. You say yes, I mean. Um, how long should it be between the time of you saying yes and them following up? Because some bands are nuts about this, and I want to see what your what the Matt co-standard is here. <laughs> um, I would say an appropriate length for probably a follow-up once someone has said yes. Um, I try to let them know, especially like one of the things that I pay attention to is when the release date is for the particular uh, product. Mm -hmm. If you've noticed at Dead Rhetoric, we don't try to have long lead times between like when the album is coming out. Um, yep. Just because of the number of releases that are out there. I mean, there are some websites that will try to put up something four to six weeks ahead of time. I think we found that it's much better if we can try and keep it like within a one week to two week uh, type of time frame. So I think a band uh, maybe following up within like seven to 10 days would be appropriate. Just see, hey, you know, did you check out the release? What did you think? And then, you know, if you want to follow up from there and say, when do you think like the album is going to, or when do you think the, the review is going to go online? I, I usually am pretty good about keeping them in the loop, especially if some of the members have reached out to me through uh, social media. Um, I can let them know on, on Facebook instantly, like when, you know, I'm done the review. Sometimes I send them a preview of actually like what the text is going to be before the live link shows up. And then I also will let them know when the live link goes up. So I would yeah. say to 10 days. I mean, if you're bugging, if you're bugging journalists every day, that's unnecessary. And it may reach a point where it may turn them off. Um, if there's too much uh, correspondence, like you won't let the journalists get to their job, which is to try and write up a constructive review of your product. Yeah, there's there's a fine line and some people don't really get what the fine line is between too much and persistence and it's hard to explain for each individual. So, um, okay, so now on another note, but similar, now let's say that a band has reached out to you and they didn't get a response from you. How frequent or how many response, or sorry, how many follow-ups before they should give up with you, for example? Um, I would say if you follow up with me uh, two or three times, especially if you think that you've read the website, you've read my reviews, you kind of know the style styles that I cover, mm -hmm. I would say two to three times is a fair amount. Um, I usually will get back to you um, fairly quickly because of the fact, like I said, uh, with my work, I'm able to have uh, the time to be able to concentrate on that. Um, I may not necessarily get to you at the same times as other people would um, due to the fact that I work an off shift job. So while a lot of the business is going on during the mornings, uh, I am sleeping. So if you expect a response in the morning time, you're probably not going to get it as much as you are like in the afternoon and evening from me. Fair. Um, and then the last part, so in the follow up part that I want to ask you about is so let's say that your okay so we've already said we've already addressed the yes part but let's say that it's not the it's not the band themselves that are reaching out to you we're going to say it's pr now i mean i kind of already know the answer to this because i am a pr but like for bands listening uh how how long should they expect between the time when the when the pr sends out the album to get a response from the writers and stuff like that in your opinion that they'll actually be doing something again um, i know the answer asking for bands. I would say uh, if a journalist is really interested uh, in, in a product from a PR firm, usually the response is within 24 to 48 hours. Yeah. Um, but if it's something that may be kind of got lost in the shuffle, it, it may take a week, week or two. It depends on the number of releases because as you know, um, it seems like schedules now are very top heavy towards the end of the month compared to the beginning mm -hmm. of the month. Um, that's where I think releases can get lost in the shuffle is 
if there's all kinds of releases coming out on the 21st or the 28th, uh, the journalist may not have enough time to see a more you know, self-released product uh, in their emails compared to something that's on a mid-size or bigger label that's been getting tremendous push. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing a lot of people don't consider is the timing. And I do try to go over that with people. Like if you, you need to figure out what else is being released in the volume around the same time. Because if you're releasing the same week as Cannibal Corpse and Me Megadeth, for it, your chances of coverage go way the fuck down. It doesn't matter how good you are. Um, you can even be a mid-sized band and your coverage chances are still going to go down as a result. Um, like even last week, like there was some fucking insane amount of releases and some big ones. And it was just like, there was even some bigger bands that didn't get covered. So right. how would you say would be the best way to stand out like, let's say you fucked up, you made your release date for Black Friday, for example, since that, to me, that's like the ultimate bad date of release. Um, there's a hundred other releases coming out, lots of biggies. What would you say would be the best way to stand to ensure that you get covered by journalists if you made that mistake, for example? Um, I mean, you basically have to come up with other things, maybe during that promotional cycle that are newsworthy. Yeah. Um, events that are happening within the band, whether it's a specific live show, you know, album release party, whether it's some playthroughs when it comes to maybe, you know, you hit the musician market where there's specific parts that, you know, musicians want to learn and can you have video for that. Um, a new video yourself, you know, maybe for another single. There's always I think people believe that there's a limited amount of time to promote a release that I don't think necessarily exists as much as uh, maybe in the past. Um, I think release cycles, you know, you've proven it as a PR firm, you can re-release something and still generate interest again in something, whether it's adding a new track or whether it's, you know, re remastering, remixing, um, offering it as a limited edition in a new format. There, there are plenty of ways to regenerate the release, even if you made the mistake originally of putting the album out on Black Friday. Um, it's just more creativity and ingenuity to get the attention to the journalist to be like, I think this needs to be covered. And it may have gotten lost with the 50 other releases that were coming out on Black Friday, but we really would appreciate like any sort of coverage, even if it's like a month, two months, six months down the road. 100%. Uh, Holly, what else do we got for questions for Matt? We're starting to run out of time. We've got probably about five minutes. Oh, I had a question and it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, let, let's see if it'll, I can get it back. Um, Why don't you ask him a question, a, British, a very British question, Holly? Ask him something British. British question? Oh, okay. Um, what is your favorite British co comedy, Matt? My favorite British comedy? Oh boy. I'm gonna go with Monty Python's Flying Circus. Oh Which one? I'm gonna go with Monty Python's Flying Circus. Okay. Okay. That's a good one. I, I would have picked a different one, but I like that one too. Cool. <laughs> what would you have picked then, Curtis? <laughs> I would have picked IT Crop. Ah. I would pick I like that show too. That, that is a very funny show. It is. But Monty Python, I, I do agree with you on that. But uh, Holly, let's hear your pick since you're the British person here. You're, you're the only one with the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, to be honest, I'd go for the IT crowd as well. Fair, but you're also but you're also not you're also a lot younger than us, too. So that so that might also explain. Maybe. Yeah. Well, have you have you heard of the Vicar of Dibley? No, I haven't. That one. That one's a good one. It, it might not sound funny, but it is. It, it it sounds it sounds weird, but okay, I'll I'll, look it up. <laughs> I'll have so, to go and look it up. So, other than British questions, uh, what other British? You got any more questions for Matt before we wrap wrap up, Holly? Um, if you could be a road sign, what road sign would you be? Wow. <clears throat> if I could be a road sign, what road sign would I be? Um, I'm gonna go with the yield sign because <clears throat> in my area where I live in Connecticut, uh, everybody ignores stop signs. So <laughs> we're going to go with the yield sign. Sometimes I think people just need to slow down and uh, take a look at their surroundings and uh, what they're doing. Uh, everybody's always in a hurry. So you need to slow down a little bit. Yeah. 
I good agree. answer. <laughs> cool. So before we wrap up, Matt, is there any final words you would like to say to anyone listening? Um, I thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I don't think uh, journalism is dead, even if it's moved to an online platform. Um, I appreciate the support that we get from everyone as far as PR firms, bands, magazines, uh, our readers. And uh, I'm 50 and I've continued to, you know, pursue the love of this genre since I was 12. And uh, I don't think it's gonna be out of my blood forever. I still feel the need always to write and express myself and express my thoughts and interview a lot of the musicians. And um, I think I'll probably be doing this until the day that I pass from this earth. Awesome. All right, Matt. Well, thank you very much for being here. And with that, we are done.